Good morning, everyone. The uh, topic uh, this morning uh, that I have is the most exciting topic of all of Mises University, Austrian alternatives to conventional economic st uh, statistics. The, yeah, that's, that's right. It's a great way to get started in the morning is talking about stats. <clears throat> right off the bat, I'd like to just acknowledge the stereotype that we all have and we've heard of, which is that Austrians are the, the students who started their econ programs and realized that uh, they just were bad at math or didn't like math. And so they just decided to stick with the school of thought where you don't have to do much math. And <clears throat> I've definitely seen and, and been on the receiving end of that stereotype uh, in my past. But it's important to note that Austrians do have uh, a healthy appreciation for numbers and data and statistics. Probably a great example of that is the presentation that we saw uh, yesterday afternoon with uh, Gene Epstein talking about data. So like, if we just you know, think about this stuff uh, in a correct way, then we actually come up with better numbers that tell a more coherent story, a better story that, that uh, corresponds with reality. Also just add that there are plenty of Austrians that are good at math or like math. I like math, so. So take that. <laughs> uh, uh, Rothbard was a mathematician. He was uh, well-trained in math. And you, even in the, the books that you see in the bookstore here, there's plenty of references to data and statistics, especially in, in economic history. So we're not afraid of math. We just have a healthy appreciation for math. Uh, probably the, the two best examples of this is in uh, what I would consider the crown jewels of Austrian economics, which are the, the economic calculation uh, critique of socialism and also Austrian business cycle theory. Both of those hinge on good numbers, or, or they hinge on accurate numbers. The, Aust the economic calculation critique of socialism is it's based on the fact that entrepreneurs don't have the right numbers, or they don't have any numbers at all, actually. So the entrepreneurs need profit and loss accounting. They need to be able to, to add up revenues, or at least anticipated revenues, and the cost of production to be able to have some sort of anticipation of profitability for the line of production that they're considering. But if they don't have that, then their production decisions are chaotic at best. The whole economy tumbles down into, into darkness and despair. So you need good numbers. And the, the same applies to Austrian business cycle theory. When the central bank increases the money supply, or if the money supply increases in other ways that comes through credit markets, the interest rate goes below the social rate of time preference. And so the interest rate no longer reflects, re reflects time preference. And so we have all of the, the chaos in the structure of production um, and the boom-bust cycle uh, results. Once again, another conclusion in Austrian uh, economics that hinges on numbers. It hinges on numbers being correct, and we need good numbers. Um, and like I said, for Austrians to do good economic history, we need to be able to look at numbers, look at data from the past, and make sense of it. Uh, first, let me go through some essential reading here on this topic. There's a wonderful article by Murray Rothbard. It's in the Economic Controversies uh, compilation uh, that Gene Epstein wrote the introduction for. He mentioned that yesterday. It's, it's called A Toward a Reconstruction of Utility and Welfare Economics. And in this uh, article, Rothbard, he, he criticizes the, the neoclassical view of utility and welfare, and he shows what What's an appropriate way to think about welfare? What's an appropriate way to think about utility? Uh, and he, it all comes to the conclusion that the only way that we could say that some sort of situation is, is welfare improving or there's an increase in welfare is if there's unanimous consent by all parties. So in voluntary exchange, both people consent to the outcome. And so we could say that that's a welfare enhancing process, um, as opposed to what you see in neoclassical, where they're, they're all using math. They're looking at utility functions, and if there's an increase in total utility as a result of, the, of exchanges or other actions and events, then we would say that that's welfare enhancing. But Rothbard says that you can't treat utility that way on, on fundamental grounds, and comes to a nice, nice result. So he sort of resurrects welfare uh, economics. There's a paper by Roderick Long in which he contrasts positivism with uh, the logical deductive method of, of praxeology in Austrian economics. And the, the key difference that he, he points out is that in, a, in positivism, in, in positive economics, there are, or yeah, just positivism, they make precisive abstractions. They make really specific assumptions about what human motivations are, what influences human action. What, if you think about a utility function, 
if an economist comes up with a mathematical equation that describes how much utility somebody gets out of consuming a certain bundle or other uh, considerations about their environment, they're making really specific assumptions about outcomes of human behavior, what humans will do based on all of the particulars. But we don't have that in Austrian economics. So we still have the law of diminishing margin utility. We still have demand curves. We can, we can sketch all of this out. But we don't make these very precisive assumptions, these very precisive abstractions. Um, and the result is the theory that we get by using the logical deductive method is theory that can be applied universally everywhere. All people, all cultures, all times, all places. If they're a human and they're acting, then we can apply praxeology to, to make sense of their, of their actions, make sense of what we see. But if you have these really precisive abstractions, then you've got to find really specific situations. And, or, and you probably won't find the exact situation where somebody's behavior is determined in the way that you have this equation set up. Anyway, another great article. I, I, I have a, a little uh, snippet from Human Action for you to check out here where uh, Mises talks through the, the different ways that economists of his time were starting to use math and, and using math to a great degree. And he points out some of the fundamental problems there. Another article by Hans Hermann Hoppe uh, talks about uh, the regressions and using econometrics. And he talks about how it, whenever we use an equation to try to describe or relate data that we've, that we've collected, it means that we're making this assumption uh, of constancy. We're making this assumption that there's this relationship that we've discovered in the data in the past. And if, if we think that's meaningful to, to any extent at all, it means that we're making an assumption that there's some sort of constant relation in, in human action. And he, of course, he points out that that's false. We can't do that. Uh, however, importantly, uh, and I, I will uh, try to get to this in the talk, he points out that there is a, a safe way to interpret econometric results. There is an innocuous interpretation of econometric results that allows us to do economic history, for example, even if we're not you know, taking it to the full extent that we see mainstream economists interpreting uh, regression results. Uh, in uh, Statistics, Achilles' Heel of Government uh, by Rothbard, he uh, talks about some of the nefarious things that governments do with data and how they twist it. Of course, we're all familiar with this in our day and age of things being redefined and um, so, the, the things that Rothbard was talking about are alive and well uh, today. Uh, a lot of the, the stuff that uh, Gene Epstein was talking about last night would fit into the same category of sort of the, the nasty things that governments do with, with data to twist it to tell a particular story. And uh, finally, I've got an example of, of good economic statistics being constructed by Austrians. So in uh, this uh, paper by uh, Murray Rothbard and, and in other related papers that he wrote with Joseph Salerno, they constructed a better measure of the money supply than what you can get anywhere else. Like you can go to the FRED website and see all of the different measures of the money supply, MZM, M1, M2, M3. And in uh, the series of papers by Rothbard and Salerno, including this one, they, uh, they showed that all of those, all of those measures are wrong. <laughs> Isn't that nice? <laughs> it's like, you've got all these measures, but none of them are quite right. And the reason why is because they, they were measuring, uh, making their measurements based on something besides the definition of money, which is a, a final means of payment, the widely accepted medium of exchange. Instead, they were using liquidity as a sliding scale to make their different measures. We'll, we'll get into this uh, later on, but I just wanted to give you the essential reading at the start. All of this uh, discussion really hinges on the distinction between theory and history. And you don't really see this distinction in the other schools of thought, but Austrians are really good about knowing the boundaries of their science. Like we, we really understand where, what are the limits of what we can say, uh, what is, what's epistemologically valid. You don't see this discussion in other schools of thought, unfortunately. It's, it seems like they just sort of skate by all of the, the methodological concerns and, and just get straight to the math without really thinking about what they're doing. Austrians are not that way. We start with, the epistemology, like what do we, how do we know what we know, and, and then what does that mean? What can we say about human action, and so on and so forth? In economic theory, we we use logical deduction. We apply logical deduction to some very safe, very universal axioms like humans act. And we define action, and we come up with claims like the the law of diminishing margin utility, or the law of demand, or e even. Uh, 
way on down the road, we can talk about the, the effects of, in, of inflation, like what happens when we increase the money supply. Uh, so all, all of this is a, is a part of a huge edifice, a huge body of, of claims that are derived logically. And the result of, of deriving those claims in that way is that we get universal claims. So since we're not making precisive abstractions, we're not making very specific assumptions about what motivates humans, it means that we get th these universal claims. And like I said, the particulars of choice, are, they're not relevant. So the law of diminishing marginal utility applies to somebody who's looking at an expanded set of apples, but also an expanded set of oranges. Like there's additional uh, units of whatever good. It doesn't matter what the good is, then it means that the, the marginal utility of, uh, decreases because the, the stock of the good is increasing. So we don't have to make particulars, particular statements about what the good is or uh, what the motivations, the specific motivations of, of the actors are. So they might want to eat the apple because they're hungry. They might want to eat the apple for all sorts of reasons. And I don't really know what other reasons you would want to eat apple besides you're just hungry. <laughs> There's probably other examples I, I could have used there. But the point is we don't, we don't, uh, we don't try to guess what people's specific uh, motivations are. And they're not relevant either. It doesn't matter. The claims of economics are what they are no matter what the motivations are. Very importantly, if we're using logical deduction and, we're do and the logic is sound, the premises are true, and we come to the conclusion in a safe way, it means that the results are not falsifiable by observation. And this is a, man, the mainstreamers, they really hate it when we say that. It's like, we, ha we have the truth, and there's nothing that we can see that would ever falsify what, like these truths that we know. And it sounds like we're being cocky. It sounds like we're, just, like we're, <clears throat> we're super, super confident. And I, it's, it's true, we are confident in those re results, but it's, it's not because uh, we just have this like, self and inflated ego, you know, it's, it's because we see the way that the, the truths, the claims are derived. Um, a, a very common analogy is, is uh, with the Pythagorean theorem. So if we went out and uh, measured uh, the lengths of the sides of a right triangle and we, we saw that the results contradict what we would expect by looking at the Pythagorean theorem, which relates the sides of a right triangle, we, if we got this one measurement that seemed to go against it, we would not toss out the Pythagorean theorem because the Pythagorean theorem was, is put together in, in a logical, deductive way based on, the, based on the definition of what a right triangle is and what distances are, how addition works, how squaring a term works, all those sorts of things. So it's, it's just true by definition, right? It doesn't, if you go out and you measure a right triangle and you get something that's off, it means that your ruler is wrong, possibly. Or maybe you're not measuring a right triangle, maybe you're measuring something else. Or, or maybe it's uh, something that looks like a right triangle, but it's on a curved surface. Some, some sort of weird example like that, where the, the assumptions aren't, aren't there in the real world. The same applies to the claims that we get in economics. So the same thing, if we, if we go out in the real world and we see, oh, it looks, like, uh, it looks like that person enjoyed the second apple way more than the first apple. Well, I guess the law of diminishing margin utility is just bunk. You know, it's like we just got to toss it out. It's like, no, it's like we, we understand the... The, the sorts of things that are true for the, or that have to be held constant uh, for these, these economic laws to, to hold in the real world. If we see change, if we see something that's different, it simply means that there's something else going on that we haven't taken into account in our, in our observation. Similar to the, the right triangle example. There are no constant relationships in, in human action, which means that there's no constant mechanical, numerical, quantitative uh, relationships uh, in economic theory, it's it's we can never ever say that that uh, consumption of apples will increase by by three percent every year or something like that. And the reason why is because there's no constants in in the way we behave. There's no constants in in the choices that we make. So we we don't have constant relationships in in economic theory. It, the goal of economic theory is also different than economic history, and also the goals of the way Austrians do economics and the way the mainstream does economics is very different, as we'll see. The, the goal, as you've seen this week, is we want to explain the real world. We want to analyze cause and effect. So hu humans have motivations. They, they act in a certain way. And we want to be able to, to come up with some true claims about why they behave, why they act, why they make the choices that, that they do in a way that, that allows us to make sense of the real world. 
That's the idea. The, the, the purpose is not prediction per se, although good economics should allow us to at least make better predictions than if we didn't have economics. Some uh, good examples of this edifice of economic theory that I'm talking about being constructed is in Human Action by Mises and uh, Man, Economy, and State. Uh, probably Man, Economy, and State by Rothbard is even a better example because it's very step by step. It's, it's probably the best, uh, <clears throat> the best source that we have of seeing this edifice of economic theory being put together. Now, all of this uh, contrasts with economic history. In economic history, we're, we take what we know from economic theory and we apply it to the past. And this doesn't have to be, you know, 100 years ago. This could be five minutes ago. It could be one minute ago. So if we're, if we're ever trying to make sense of what we observe, and if we're observing something, it means it's necessarily in the past, uh, it means that we're, we're doing history and not theory. So it's the application of theory to the, to the past. When we're doing history, we can uh, identify some uh, particulars. And uh, some of this might be some speculation, like we, there, there might be people who have two, two different per perspectives on the same event happening, and so they'll see different things. And so that's, there's a little bit more speculation about it. Uh, motivations can be guessed. We're all human, so we, we understand what it means to be incentivized to do something, for example. like we. Like if we see somebody you know, going to school to, to learn skills so that they could get a promotion at, at their job, like we, can guess, like we can guess all those motivations. All we see is the person you know, signing up for school, and then they either get or they don't get the, the promotion that they were seeking, right? But we only see that, and all of the extra stuff is just us trying to guess what their motivations are. And we, those could be really safe assumptions, or it could be, there could be a lot of guesswork involved, just depending. And like I said, it's all open to interpretation. We don't get the epistemologically rock-solid claims when we're doing history. All we get is, our, if we're going beyond just a basic description of, of what is observed, it means that we're doing some guesswork, we're doing some, some speculation. Some great examples of this, of, of economic history, is America's Great Depression by Rothbard. Uh, I, I love that book. You should definitely read that. Every, every Austrian uh, student should, should read that book. Uh, because it starts off with theory, then it applies that theory to the past in a, in a great way. And also, uh, <clears throat> another good example is uh, Robert Higgs' Crisis in Leviathan, <clears throat> where he's doing um, um, economic history. Great, great book. And here, you'll notice in, in both America's Great Depression and in Crisis in Leviathan, they look at numbers. They use statistics, right? And, and it's totally safe. They're not... They're not using statistics to try to falsify economic theory. They're using statistics to make sense of the past in conjunction with a good knowledge of economic theory to, to make claims about you know, uh, why the government grows the way that it, that it grows or, or why, why there was a big bust in, in 1929 and so on and so forth. <clears throat> to give you a picture visually of the difference between uh, Austrian economics and what the mainstream looks like, I, these are random draws. I, I'm not lying. These are true random draws from both Man, Economy, and State and then just a, a top mainstream journal, the AER. And on the left, there's a great example of Rothbard using this, this uh, deductive method to come up with a, a fresh claim. In, in this case, it's a footnote on page 116 where he's talking about what if, uh, what if the goods are discrete and we can't get an exact equilibrium? Like what if the market can't clear exactly because the of the way the, the preferences of the suppliers and the demanders are set up, and the, and the goods are, are discrete, so we can't get that exact intersection. And he just talks through, well, this would have to be the case. They would have to just get as close as they can, right? Very, very simple deduction there. <clears throat> so we don't get an exact equilibrium, but they get close. They might bounce back and forth you know, over time. So, but compare just visually what that looks like to the mainstream, where it's another language, right? <laughs> it's, it's these. Uh, mathematical equations with a bunch of symbols and, and of course, hopefully the, the equations mean something to the authors. Probably doesn't mean much to anybody else, <laughs> right? Everybody else just sort of nods their head, you know, when they're going through these papers at, the, at their academic conferences. <clears throat> uh, allow me a, a quick story. I was, I was at a, a paper presentation at Auburn where um, uh, I studied and it was a macroeconomist who was presenting this paper. And one of the uh, microeconomists uh, who specialize in, in labor, they're all siloed. There's health economists and consumer economists and labor economists. This guy specializes in labor economists. He leaned over to me and he says, 
I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> so like there's this like two mainstream economists, the, the macroeconomist and the micro guy, and they're just like, they're talking straight past each other. And, and so, so the feeling that you get by looking at the, the stuff on the right is similar to what even mainstream economists feel when they're seeing uh, these papers presented. <clears throat> but I just wanted you to see visually, like what, is, what does the mainstream look like? Uh, Rothbard has a great preface to a book by uh, Mises called Theory and History, one of the more underrated books uh, uh, by Mises, I would say. It's a great book. Um, <clears throat> Here, uh, Rothbard is talking about the, the subject of economics as humans and what that means for how we do economics. How do we go about doing social science with the, what we know about how humans are different from, say, inanimate objects? <clears throat> Therefore, atoms and stones can be investigated, their courses charted, and their paths plotted and predicted, at least in principle, to the minutest quantitative detail. People cannot. Everyday people learn, adopt new values and goals, and change their minds. People cannot be slotted and predicted as can objects without minds or without the capacity to learn and choose. So uh, an example that I like to use in classes uh, is dropping a tennis ball. We can, we can hold a tennis ball and drop it and we see, we could do this a million times. It would take a long time to do that, but you could drop the tennis ball a million times and you could time it, you can, you can make observations and you, you would come up with this conclusion that that the tennis ball falls, and you might come up with the law of gravity by doing this over and over and over again. So you have this, this explanation for the behavior of the tennis ball, tennis ball by dropping it a million times. It would be wholly inappropriate, incorrect, nonsensical to say the tennis ball likes the ground, right? Or the, the tennis ball likes to bounce, or the, the preference of the tennis ball is to fall towards the ground, right? This just it's a nonsense statement, and the reason why is because we know the tennis ball does not have a human mind. However, when we're talking about the end of this lecture, when everybody stands up and gives me a standing ovation to, because the, the talk was so great, then we would use that sort of language. Like We would re refer to your motivations and values and preferences and these sorts of things. So the, the way that we should treat humans is not the way that we should treat inanimate objects. It's a very simple conclusion. However, if you look at the way mainstream economics is done, is they're treating humans like objects. They're treating humans like th these uh, uh, bodies that have mechanical constant relationships with their environments, right? So great point by Rothbard. Here's another one. The use of statistics and quantitative data may try to mask this fact, and he's talking about the fact that it's impossible to test economic theory. But their seeming precision is only grounded on historical events that are not homogeneous in any sense. Each historical event is a complex, unique resultant of many causal factors. Since it is unique, it cannot be used for positivistic test. And since it is unique, it cannot be combined with other events in the form of statistical correlations and achieve any meaningful result. So we might, we might try to do the, the same thing that we did with the tennis ball, like dropping the tennis ball and just repeating observations to, to come up with a conclusion about how tennis balls behave when they're dropped. We might try to do that same sort of method with humans and just watch people go into a, a restaurant, right? And we see people go into the restaurant over and over again. We might even see some of the same people come in uh, over uh, subsequent weeks, right? So like the same person goes into the same restaurant. And we would never, ever be able to come up with a constant relationship, right? We would never be able to say, that people always do this, or people are even likely to, to do this. We might, we, we might come up with the probabilities, but the, the point is that those probabilities could change with, with additional um, observations. We might see people start buying different dishes, right? Or they, they sit at different tables. And the reason why is because humans, they're not tennis balls. Humans are, we, we make choices. Even if we're in very similar situations, we can behave, we can act choose in, in totally different uh, ways. So humans are, are different, and so we can't, we can't use that method to study human action. That's the point. So why, why are they obsessed with data? So I'm going to start, try to get into the statistics part here. So why is it that the mainstream, they, they love their statistics? And so here I just have a very quick overview of the, of the way mainstream microeconomics or neoclassical economics is set up. Here, uh, consumers, they have a utility function, and with that utility function, which is based on consuming different bundles of goods, uh, 
uh, you can map out indifference curves where they would have the same level of utility by consuming the, the different quantities of the good. And so that's what those curved lines are. Those are the indifference curves. And uh, you see like right off the bat, just by drawing the curve, either the utility function or the indifference curve, you'll notice that they've, they've already made a bad assumption. And that bad assumption is that the goods that are consumed by uh, people are continuous and not discrete. We, do, we don't consume continuous goods. There, there are no continu like exactly perfectly continuous goods anywhere just because of the fact that you could go down to the atom or the molecule, right? So there's, there are no continuous goods. Like you, you, never, uh, you never go up to uh, an ice cream shop and, and they'll say you, you can buy different numbers of scoops. And you, it's not the possibility for you to say, I would like 1.2136925. And you just, you're there for you know, 16 hours <laughs> with the, going out to this, this very long fraction telling them how many scoops that you want, right? So we don't make decisions on those sorts of margins. We make, we make decisions on discrete margins. Yet, if you're drawing this, uh, this nice smooth curve like this, you're making the assumption that the goods that are consumed by consumers are, are continuous and not discrete. They uh, combine these indifference curves with a budget constraint. Uh, and what that means is you can do some calculus. You can find the tangent line where the, you, you get the highest indifference curve. The indifference curve that's associated with the most amount of utility, it, and you consume the bundle where there's that tangency point with the budget set, the budget constraint and the, the indifference curve. Some of you are having nightmares right now. Others of you are like, this is so boring because I see it all the time in school. Hopefully I'm bridging the gap somewhere. But uh, you'll notice that they're making another assumption. Uh, well, depending on the economist, uh, it's either an assumption or just uh, something to make it more tractable. And, uh, and that is that uh, we use math to, co to come up with uh, our, our decisions. Like how many of you walk down the grocery store aisle and you're trying to figure out how many jars of peanut butter or whatever to put in your cart to take to their cash register. And like the first thing that you do to make that decision is you pull out your calculator and you, and you take a derivative of your utility function to find the tangency point of, <laughs> of your budget set and your difference. It's like, no, nobody does this. So, so that at the very least, they violated Occam's razor. They've made, they've made this uh, simple qualitative event of deciding to put peanut butter in your cart uh, and they've made it much more complex than it needs to be. So there's a violation of, of Occam's razor there. Uh, but yeah, that's the, the, the reason I show this is to say they're thinking about human behavior in a mathematical sense, which means that they're going to want data so that they can test their theories, so that they can make predictions, so they can do all this sort of stuff. So if humans are behaving in this sort of mathematical way, or we can at least think about their behavior in a mathematical way, then they're going to desire all of those statistics. Just a quick contrast to causal realist or Austrian economics. How do we think about consumer choice? Individuals act to bring about a preferred state. Very controversial, right? Preference can only be demonstrated in action. Action is the use of means for a purpose, the attainment of an end. And when we're acting, we're, we're trying to substitute, uh, we're trying to get a more satisfactory state of affairs and forego a less satisfactory state of affairs. So, so we describe human action in qualitative terms. We're not making precisive abstractions. We allow humans to, to consider and consume discrete goods as opposed to continuous goods. We don't assume that people are doing math to come up with their optimal consumption bundle and so on and so forth. So it's, it just seems like, like if you, suppose you're just a random person off the street who came in here, it seems like this, this is a closer approximation, we'll say, of what's going on in our minds when we're making decisions, right? It just seems more intuitive. All right, so let's make, I, I can do this uh, quickly since we've already, I've already talked about some of the differences along the way. Importantly, the, the two approaches have very different goals. So the, in the mainstream, they're trying to model behavior so that they can make good predictions. They wanna make quantitative predictions as well. However, in the causal realist tradition where our goal is to explain and understand what's going on in the real world. Consumer behavior is explained in very different ways. In the mainstream, they uh, use or act as if they use math to make decisions. Uh, if, you, if, you ask a, if you ask them, they wouldn't say that consumers actually use math to make their decisions. They would say that they act as if, but it's still fun to make, to make fun of them uh, for, <laughs> for doing all, all of the math that they do. And in fact, here's one example of that. So here's a couple that uh, they're trying to decide if they should have kids. 
And uh, so they say, let's consult the utility function. So they do a bunch of math in their heads, and they, they plug all of the data into their family utility function, and then out, just timelessly, pops a couple kids. It's like, so this is how they, they consider humans and their behavior. The elements are conceived in different ways. So we have continuous goods uh, that are consumed to achieve a certain level of utility that's actually uh, the process is actually using or thinking of utility in a cardinal way. Now, there are some uh, ways that you can justify this by saying that, well, the utility functions could, could be mapped to any set of preferences that are ordinal. You hear this a lot. Uh, but the point is that the way, the way that they're constructing, at least the utility function, is that you consume a certain quantity of goods, and that gives you a certain quantity of, of utility, much different than the, the way Austrians conceive of it. And uh, they make a lot of assumptions about the scope of the consumer's knowledge as well. So you have to, to be able to, to isolate one consumption bundle in the neoclassical view, you have to rule out all other possible bundles. But in Austrian economics, we understand that no, for you to make a decision, you just have to make a comparison of two possible states of affairs, the one in which you consume blank and the one in which you don't consume blank, for example. Okay, moving on to, to mainstream macro. And once again, I'm, I'm just trying to lay out the case for, or show you why the mainstreamers love their data. And eat, once we go from micro to macro, there's no big surprise, hopefully, they all, they're also very mathematical, right? The macro models are, if not more, more high-minded, high, very sophisticated math in the macro than there is in micro. Um, and the, I have a few examples up here. There's the Keynesian models with agri-supply and agri-demand. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the Keynesian models when we go through uh, GDP in just a second. But the point is that this, these are all math-driven. With the solo growth models, you're plugging in numbers to get uh, a growth rate for the economy based on depreciation rates and so on. And then there's the dynamic, stochastic, general equilibrium models where you're applying a, a certain numerical shock to the economy to see what the result is, numerical result is. All math everywhere. Okay, so finally, let's get to some data. The, the way uh, GDP uh, is thought of is it, it's a, if you put a sensor up to the pipeline, the flow of money in the circular flow, then you're measuring total spending in the economy. You're measuring total income. And so that's... The, the reason why they like GDP is because it's a, it's a measure of the circular flow in, in the economy. So, so let's look at GDP. You can open up any principles textbook and see this definition. GDP is the market value of all final goods and services produced within a country over a given uh, time period. And they use uh, prices as a common denominator, but we'll see that even though they use this common denominator with market prices, uh, there's still some heterogeneity within GDP that's, that's problematic. Uh, they rule out uh, intermediate goods, and the reason why is because they don't want a double counting problem. We'll see that there's an issue with that as well. Uh, they only look at uh, domestic production. That's fine, depending on the question that you're trying to answer. Uh, and it's uh, over a specific time period, so it's a flow variable. And it's all, it's all based on uh, this, uh, this Keynesian equation of the y is equal to c plus i plus g. If, if you have an open economy, then you include uh, net exports as well. The, these first issues with GDP, you'll actually find in the textbooks. <laughs> You'll find in the principles, they'll give you the definition, and they'll say, so here's, here's what GDP is, and here's all the problems with it. <laughs> so you would think that they would like, you know, do a little bit of introspection. It's like, maybe we should fix some of these problems, or at least acknowledge it. At, if, we're, if we're acknowledging it at the principles level, then why aren't we acknowledging it at the higher level? Uh, but the issues that they point out is that you're ignoring household production. So since you're, you're uh, adding up all spending, if you're producing something, but it's not exchanged on the market, then there's no spending, like mowing your own lawn or um, cleaning your own room, those, those sorts of things. So that, that's, even though it's a part of national product, technically speaking, it's not included in GDP because there's no spending associated with it. In a similar way, uh, black market transactions are excluded because we don't have a record of that spending. By definition, it's a black market transaction. Uh, another issue is that GDP per capita is not a good measure of overall well-being. The, so they tried, they tried to correlate uh, GDP per capita with different measures of happiness and life satisfaction. And usually they're using survey data to, to make that comparison. They notice that there, there's not much of a correlation there. There's lots of issues with doing that. So either the survey data is wrong or GDP is, is wrong, or at least we can't use GDP per capita to measure well-being and satisfaction. But Austrians, we get to just say, well, maybe they're both wrong. <laughs> survey data is probably bad as well. 
Uh, and another issue with GDP that they would point out is that leisure is valuable. So actually stopping production, you know, going home and relaxing on the weekend or retiring at the end of your career is valuable. Like we like that, but it would decrease GDP. So we're getting something that we want, but it decreases GDP. All right, so these next three, these are more Austrian. So we'll spend a little bit more time on these. Uh, even though they have the market price as a common denominator, the, the stuff inside GDP is very heterogeneous. First of all, consumption is different than investment. And the government spending, as we'll see in point seven here, is extremely different and actually should probably, probably be excluded. Um, I mean, depending on the, the sort of question that you're trying to answer. But it's not just a heterogeneous inside. It's, uh, it, it's also uh, heterogeneous throughout the population, meaning that the GDP doesn't tell you anything about the distribution of wealth or the distribution of, of income throughout the, the economy. It doesn't tell you anything about growth potential. So GDP could be massive, but if it's because we're just going through a big consumptive binge, like in the artificial, uh, or the, yeah, the boom of a boom-bust cycle, then GDP is increasing. And you might, if you're uh, a macroeconomist, you might think, oh, we're on this nice tra trajectory of growth, right? But if you're an Austrian economist, you know, well, actually, you, know, you have to maintain your structure of production. Your structure of production has to be consistent with time preferences and the, and the subsistence fund or the amount of consumption goods that would last you through the period of production. So if you don't have that, then you're actually, you don't have much growth potential, even though your GDP is increasing. Also, the size of the government. Once again, we'll wait for uh, uh, number seven. <clears throat> number six here, consumption is exaggerated in GDP. So GDP is not total spending in the economy. It's, uh, it's total spending minus uh, spending on intermediate goods, right? So it's only tallying up the spending on final goods and services, which means that if you're, if, you're try, if you're a politician, perhaps, and you're trying to make policy based on what are the important things in the economy, and you're looking at the components of GDP, you would come to this, this bad conclusion that consumption is really important for the economy. Right? However, you're missing out on a lot of investment spending. So consumption spending is exaggerated as a, as a proportion of GDP. If you include all, the spend, all of the other spending on the intermediate products through the structure of production, then we put uh, consumption in its place. It's a, it's a much smaller portion of, of, of our Western industrialized, very large economies that we have. So you get a, a bad picture of the importance of consumption when you look at GDP. Well, we'll talk, there's a, a fix for this. Uh, we'll talk about that later. And finally, most importantly, I would say, government is different, right? So con consumption spending is based on people's own net worth calculations, and, they're make and they have their own preferences, their own budgets, right? They're making decisions on what to buy. Investment spending is based on similar preferences and anticipations about the future. It's based on uh, profit calculation, profit anticipation. The same thing applies to net exports. So exports and imports are people you know, trading goods across borders based on their own preferences and profit calculations. But government is not subject to those sorts of things. The, the level of government spending is based on political whims. It's based on politicians and, their, and what helps them get elected. It's the, the stuff that government spends money on is not necessarily related to what consumers value. I know that's a very controversial statement here at Mises University, but there's really not a, there's not a connection there. Since their, their revenues is based on forcible taxation or through uh, the printing press, right? They get, they get their money this way, and then they spend money on stuff, but there's no connection, right? It's not like, uh, it's not like you pay more taxes because you like what the government is producing for you, right? There's no, there's no connection like there is in the private market where producers, they make stuff for a profit, and they only make the sale that they convince the consumer that they, what they're giving up, the payment for the product, is, is less important to them than the product that they're receiving, as we've, as, as we've seen th this week. So government expenditures are just categorically different than the other things. They should probably be excluded in certain situations, like what Robert Hicks does in this article about uh, the myth of uh, wartime prosperity. If you look at GDP through World War II, it looks like we had a gigantic economic boom. And the reason why is because the government was spending a ton of money on waging war, right? So a huge increase in G, right? So the government spending component of, of GDP was just massive, right? Because we, we were waging war, spending lots of money on different things. However, if you take 
the government spending component out, you get private GDP. So here's our, and a great Austrian alternative to conventional economic statistics. Private GDP takes government spending out of GDP, and you get a better picture of what your average Joe felt, experienced during wartime, which was basically a depression. Look, look at the dip there in private GDP. It looks almost like the Great Depression that was a few years before. We did not have wartime prosperity. We had wartime depression. We had wartime shortages, and they had to ration all sorts of consumer goods during the war as well. So this was not, if you, if you pretend you don't see the black bars, right? If you're just looking at GDP, you're like, oh, wow. War is great for the economy. And as we know that this is because of the broken window fallacy, right? We know that this is that's just wrong. And if you look at the data in a correct way, you see, oh yeah, there's the there's the cost of the war right there. It's it, we had to take a cut into what what regular people, what the citizens were consuming. Another important uh, result that we get from this exercise is uh, you, you'll notice that. If you just look at GDP, it looks like we had this massive depression, massive recession at the end of the war, right? And all the Keynesian economists, as we know, were saying that. They were saying that if we end the war, then we're just going to go back into the Great Depression. But if you'll notice, the private GDP shot up. So like, what's actually uh, felt and experienced by the citizens of, this, of the United States was totally different than what GDP reflected. And it's because government spending is categorically different. Uh, David Howden goes through a similar exercise. He's looking at the impact of, uh, of recessions on two different groups, private workers and public workers, people who work in the private market economy and people who work for the, for the government. And if you divide government spending by public workers, then there's really not much of a, of a bad effect of the recession. So the recession mainly affects private workers. A another great uh, conclusion here. Since government is not subject to the profit and loss test of the market, Recessions don't really matter to the government. In fact, you'll notice that the governments do quite well during recessions, right? So another great, uh, using Austrian insights and coming up with better data, we can come to some enlightening conclusions. <clears throat> so you remember I, I talked about how consumption is exaggerated uh, in GDP. Uh, one way that we can get around that is by just including all the intermediate spending. And there's good reason to do that, namely because it exists. So we, here's the Austrian conception of production. We've got the structure of production. There is spending, right, on all the consumption goods at the bottom. But there's also a lot of spending on the intermediate goods, all the capital goods in the early and, and middle stages of production. So if you want to measure a total spending in the economy, <clears throat> you should include all of those. And if you do that, then you get what's called gross output or gross domestic expenditures. And both uh, Murray Rothbard and Mark Skousen were, uh, they were advocates for this. And, I'm not sure if it was because of their, their calls for it, or I guess uh, Mark Skousen's calls for it. In 2014, the BA actually started releasing statistics on uh, gross domestic expenditures. <clears throat> but you'll notice the blue line is, is gross output. The red line is GDP. And one nice result here is that there's more variation in gross output during the recession. You see the recession there, that's when gross output goes down. right? So there's more variation in gross output. And why is that? So you people were paying attention to my lecture yesterday on Austrian business cycle theory. It's a huge collapse in demand for capital goods. All those specific capital goods, they decrease in value during, the, during a recession, during the bust. So you see that very clearly in gross output because you have all the spending in those intermediate stages. Uh, but it, the red line at the bottom, GDP, there, is, there was a small decrease, right? At least relatively small, but you, it's not as clear there. So <clears throat> something like looking at or measuring recessions, which is... It's, people are talking about it a lot these days, something like gross output would probably be a better measure. Now let's talk about the price level. Austrians hate the price level. <laughs> uh, we don't hate it. We just don't think that it exists. We're a price level, I guess. We're not anti-price level. We're a price level. Um, and, but to just set up the problem, uh, mainstream economists, they would like to be able to talk about price inflation. They'd like to be able to talk about prices in general throughout the economy. But there's a, a very serious units problem when you're trying to come up with something like an average price. And the units problem looks like this. So you have, if, suppose you're the bundle that's important to the average consumer. So our, con, our consumer average price would look like this, where you have a $10 burrito, a $22.15 haircut, and then the uh, $393,000 Lamborghini. If you 
add all those prices up and divide by three, you get a number here, 131,242.383. But if you ask the question, what are the units of this figure, you get nonsense, <laughs> right? It's just bogus. Does it, it's not useful in any, any application at all. So to, to get around it, they, they construct a, an index. They compare the, the bundle, the, the price of the bundle to itself. So it's a, it's a unitless uh, solution. So we have this units problem, so let's just annihilate the units by comparing the, the series to itself. So they come up with a bundle of goods that's important to the average consumer using survey data. The, the Bureau of Labor Statistics does this. And they compare the, the price of that bundle, the total price of, like if you imagine putting it all into one basket and taking it up to the checkout to, to pay for it, and you see how that how that, the price of that basket changes over time, then you're measuring uh, the price index or, or price inflation in that way. So that's how they do it. All right, so there's some issues with this. Even with indexing, there's still an apples and oranges problem, mainly because they change the bundle from year to year. All right, so the basis of comparison is, is changing. They're not comparing something to itself. They're comparing the, the price of the basket of goods that was important to the average consumer in 2021 with the price of the basket of goods that was important to the average consumer in 1972, right? Totally different baskets, right? So, they, so they're, they're still, there's still a fundamental units problem here. Even though they've gotten rid of the units, there's still an uh, apples and oranges problem here. Importantly, uh, if you're looking at CPI, uh, it hides relative prices, and uh, you don't see Cantillon effects. So the Cantillon effects refer to the unevenness of, of, in, of increasing the money supply always comes to a specific point in the economy. So somebody spends it first, and then somebody takes has the higher income, and then they spend it second, and then somebody takes that, that and they spend it. So prices increase like, like rippling out from the source. They, it's not like we have this sea level rise when there's an increase in the money supply. CPI hides all of that. You don't see any of that, but it's extremely important, right? Uh, Cantillon effects uh, is actually extreme. I didn't even mention this yesterday. It's extremely important in telling the Austrian business cycle story because Austrian business cycle theory is actually just a special application of Cantillon effects. New money pours forth on credit markets first, and then it, the money is used to do all sorts of things like expanding consumption and, and uh, expanding and lengthening the structure of production, right? All these sorts of things. Those are all Cantillon effects. Unevenness in the flow of new money into the economy. You don't see that with CPI. Uh, finally, most importantly, like I mentioned, there's no such thing as the price level. So we would like for the statistics that we're coming up with, if we're trying to apply economic theory to history, we would like for the numbers that we're coming up with to relate to what our theory actually has. But unfortunately, in economic theory, there's no such thing as the price level as one number. The price level is, is best con considered as an array. It's all of the prices, right? All of the prices that consumers face. There's uh, great quotes from uh, Mises that <clears throat> uh, housewives, those who do the, the spending, they go to the grocery store and uh, buy the goods uh, for their household, they are in a better position to measure in, in price inflation than the government officials with their price indexes, right? And simply because that's what the price level is. It's the, the prices that you face. A good quote from uh, Rothbard here on that uh, specific point. Let's look at uh, money supply measures. The, <clears throat> the way that the money supply measures are put together is based on liquidity. So they have uh, money zero maturity, MZM. They have M1, which has some extra stuff. So M2, that has some more stuff that's not quite as liquid as the stuff in M1. And M3 and M4, I, can't, I don't even know how far out they go, but they just keep adding stuff to these different money supply measures based on how liquid it is, or how easy is it for you to, to, uh, to sell those, those different uh, financial assets. And of course, uh, Salerno and Rothbard point out that this is bogus, that's not the money supply. If you're, if you're doing it based on liquidity, then you're not measuring money, you're measuring something else. They say what matters for the money supply is what is immediately spendable. What is, a, uh, what is a final means of payment right now? So you ha that means you have to exclude all credit transactions, you have to exclude uh, traveler's checks, you have to exclude time deposits where there's a delay in you being able to access your money. So there's all sorts of things that you would have to exclude. Uh, I recommend that you check it out. They, uh, the, the article that I, I mentioned at the beginning is a, is a good exercise in showing, well, yeah, we can include this because 
it, it does fit the definition. No, we can't include this because it doesn't fit the definition. So much, much better uh, measures uh, that we get by applying good economic theory to statistics. Thank you.